What if you were a military general and you knew you were going to be invaded? Suppose you knew who was going to attack and from what direction they would come. Now imagine you knew where the battle would be fought and by what margin you would win. Bible prophecy gives these details of two coming wars and both will involve Israel. In this tape, World Prophetic Ministry presents a new two-part study of these end-time wars by Dr. Dave Brees. To get the most from his teaching, you should have your Bible, notebook, and pencil ready. Dr. Brees' first message deals with the invasion of Israel by Russia and is titled, The Battle of Hemingog. It may be that at a given moment, your impressions and mine could be that the world is sort of uh, settling down into days of plenty, years of peace, march of a strong land, swift increase, as the poet says. It may be that we have the impression at the moment that we are looking into a benign future and all of our problems are past. Never make such a mistake because the idea that peace is God's plan for all of the peoples and the nations of the world while yet they live in a state of rebellion against him is totally false and when we think of it a second time it is entirely ridiculous. We are moving into a time that will be absolutely amazing in the developments that shall burst upon us one after the other possibly with so great rapidity that we will be totally astonished about almost every circumstance in life the Bible says, when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as travail upon a woman with child. And never has that been more true than it is today. We live in a time in which we must allow for the possibility that our very lives could behold scenes that are prophetic in nature, that are devastating as far as the world is concerned, and that we must not miss being prepared for. That's why we want to take these valuable moments to talk together about what we have called the Battle of Ham and Gog. And we have used this expression, Ham and Gog, in order to distinguish this battle from a final devastating conflict that will end the age and bring to pass the final consummation of history. But there is coming a battle perhaps very soon. We have called it the Battle of Ham and Gog because it is the story of one of the most exciting set of events that is found anywhere in all of literature. The Old Testament account of that awful conflict that will bring to pass the end of a certain age called the Day of Grace and will bring into being another age which is called the tribulation. And in that the tribulation may well be soon bursting upon us, we should think together about the battle of Ham and Gog. It is the story, as perhaps you know, given to us in the 38th and 39th chapters of Ezekiel, in which the Bible talks about a massive movement of an army from the north that overwhelms in its attempt, that is, it attempts to overwhelm the entire Middle East, and there are consequences of that battle that last into the years immediately to come that are very, very interesting. In fact, when we think of them for another moment, we should catch our breath to anticipate what perhaps soon is to take place. Now, in thinking about this battle described to us in the Old Testament, we've thought about it from more than one point of view. First of all, the gathering storm. The situation that must come together to make possible this battle are several. And perhaps the primary one that we should keep in mind is that in order to have the battle of Ezekiel 38 take place, we must have, first of all, a very remarkable development across the world where God reaches out into 100 nations of the world and performs one of the most astonishing social miracles that could ever be conceived. Namely, he brings to pass a regathering of the nation of Israel. Analogously, the Bible talks about this in the sense of God speaking to a valley of dry bones, a virtual cemetery, and he calls these dry bones to live again. And he says, that's what it's going to be like with the nation of Israel. And when we see Israel regathered in the land, you are watching that set of events, which according to the Old Testament, is the immediate prelude to the battle of Ham and Gog. Listen to what the scripture says about Israel. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the nations to which they are gone. I will gather them on every side and bring them into their own land. And I will make of them one nation 
in the land upon the mountains of Israel, and one king shall be king to them, and they shall be no more two nations, neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms anymore. And this passage goes on to talk about how God will reconstitute a nation that has for all practical purposes disappeared. Has that happened to the nation of Israel? Yes, indeed. For 2,000 years, Israel has been, an, in effect, a non-existent nation, existing only in ghettos and among the lives of people scattered across the world. But we have seen in our time that astonishing event. Israel regathered in the land of Israel. But in order to bring to pass this situation, the Battle of Ham and Gog, we must also have a condition where Israel appears to prosper and therefore becomes the envy of nations of the world. In fact, the scripture says that when the battle begins, the enemy says, I will go up to the land of unwalled villages to go to those who are at rest to take a spoil and to take a prey and turn my hand upon the desolate places that are now inhabited. So not only is Israel there, but Israel has turned a land that was desolate into a beautiful garden of roses and vines and plenty and prosperity. This must also be apparent. Thirdly, Israel must become provocative in the eyes of the nations of the world. The nations must look up at it with envy. They must think of Israel perhaps as being some kind of a cosmic enemy. And there are many evidences that that is taking place in our time as well. But it's also true that Israel must appear to be undefended. It must appear to possess riches that then become the enemy of the onlooking nations of the world, and especially this nation from the north. Is that happening today? Ah, indeed it is. And by the way, about a nation being undefended or appearing to be so, that possesses great riches, did we not see what could happen to a nation like that in the battle for Kuwait? Kuwait, with its immense wealth, was looked upon by Saddam Hussein of Iraq. And he said, let's go take that land because they can't defend themselves. Any nation of the world that appears to be undefended becomes the object of envy, especially if that nation pro pro possesses wealth that may be the desire of those looking on. And that situation, I submit to you, has already developed before our very eyes in the Middle East today. You have Israel dwelling safely. You have other nations, and particularly those named in Scripture, looking at the nation of Israel with great desire. Who are those nations? What do they intend to do? That's what we want to talk about in just a moment. So the Bible says, when Israel dwells safely in the land, which it does as of now, apparently, it will become the object of great envy. It will be the provocateur of the nations of the world. And when this condition comes to pass, it will be the prelude to one of the most smashing invasion attempts that has ever been held in all of history. And that is the battle of Ham and Gog. It is that thunder from the north that now issues from the gathering storm. Listen to what the scripture says. The word of the Lord came unto me, that's Ezekiel speaking, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog of the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. Now, I know that there are many who wonder about the meaning of that expression, the chief prince. Actually, the Hebrew for that is the prince of Rosh, R-O-S-H, Meshach and Tubal. So what it actually says is, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, which sounds like Moscow, Tobolsk, uh, Tubal, which sounds like Tobolsk, that the leader of this complex, this place called Rosh, or if you please, Russia, he will then look with great desire to the south, and it's that desire that will precipitate the battle of Ezekiel 38. But of course, he does not come alone. I will turn thee back, God says, and put hooks into thy jaws. I will bring thee forth all thine army, horses, horsemen, all of them clothed with all sorts of armor even shields and handling swords, Russia, Persia, uh, or, uh, pardon me, Russia, Ethiopia, and Libya with them, all of them with shield and helmet, Gomer and all his hordes, the house of Togarma of the north quarters and all of its hordes, and many peoples with them. So the Bible talks about allies that will tie themselves together with this great power from the north. And these allies <clears throat> certainly can be noted on a map that we have here. 
Here is tiny little Israel hugging the Mediterranean Sea, a sliver of land on that east coast of the Mediterranean, and it is already surrounded by tremendous hostility. But you look to the north of the city of Jerusalem and you arrive at Moscow, the Prince of Rosh. He decides to move against the Middle East, but he brings with him an alliance with Iran, that is Persia, with Turkey, with Gomer that we believe to be elements of East Germany, also from the south, over here is Libya and down here is Ethiopia. And he's able to put together an alliance militarily by these nations against the nation of Israel. And with that alliance, he thinks of himself as being invincible. Now, to think for just a moment about the components of aggressive war, this may be helpful. Nobody moves to accomplish military aggression unless there are at least two conditions that are the case. One is a desirable prize. You don't go to battle without something that you want to get. Well, that desirable prize is certainly the case in the Middle East today. We've already had a number of wars, and one rather recently, that involved itself with Desert Shield and Desert Storm, and that war was all about who controls the oil of the Middle East. That can be a desirable prize. Plus, this is the land bridge to everywhere from the kingdoms of the north. But that prize in the nation of Israel will beguile the Prince of Rosh to move to the south. But secondly, and here's where we need to think quite intelligently, you also must have the presumed absence of effective resistance. You don't go to war against anybody if you're rather sure you will be killed in the process. Now, why hasn't Russia in days gone by moved to the attempted conquest of Israel? The answer is primarily that the Middle East and the nation of Israel has been protected by a mighty nation of whom you are familiar. And that nation is the United States of America. It's America's nuclear capability and its willingness to mobilize itself that has protected Israel today. Israel has been the number one friend of the United States. And therefore, we can ask the question, and it's almost a scary question to ask, what has happened to that protection? By the time we see the Prince of Rosh move to the south, what has happened? A number of possibilities. Possibility number one is that America will have been the object of some kind of a military blow that will take it out of contention in this battle for the world. I've noticed a verse in the midst of this military description in which God says what he will do upon this battle occasion on behalf of the nation of Israel. But then he says, I will send a fire on Magog and among those who dwell securely in the coastlands and they shall know that I am the Lord. So God is talking about somebody else, someone who thinks that he dwells securely in the coastlands and that nation and other nations will also have an effect come upon them from this devastating war by which they will be reminded of spiritual reality as well. Is it possible that sending a fire to the coastlands may even mean that God would send a fire to the coast of the United States? I have some friends who analyze this, not particularly from a Christian point of view, but they had long thought of the possibility of America being the object of a nuclear strike perhaps especially on one part of its coast, namely the city of New York. If New York were taken out with one nuclear weapon, it would demoralize America. It would take out its business leadership, but not its manufacturing capability. And it would make America at least to be preoccupied with that thing long enough to forget any obligation to protect the Middle East, a possibility that ought not to be discounted. Colin Powell, Joint Chiefs of Staff, Chairman of the United States, has said, remember something, whatever else you think about Russia, it's the one nation in the world that could destroy the United States in 30 minutes. That is not to be discounted. When a nation talks about peace, that's interesting. But if in connection with that speech, it has 11,000 nuclear warheads pointed at you, then you must be very concerned. But there are other possibilities that could take the United States out in contention for the world. I am not sure we have time to mention them all, but, what, but I want you to think of one in particular, namely the rapture of the church. The rapture of the church would have an effect upon every nation of the world, but it would take out America's top leadership. It would leave the leadership of America absent so that people would be wondering very much what to do and how to handle the situation. 
We need to talk more about that in just a moment and then consider surveying the wreckage of this great battle back in just a moment. We must face the fact that a storm is gathering with reference to the Middle East and for that matter, with reference to the whole world. People are so prone to believe in peace, but they ignore the fact that the Bible says, there is no peace, says my God to the wicked. In fact, the Bible indicates that the veil of peace may many times have behind it the deadly intention of war. And so we've discussed the gathering storm whereby Nations are once again in a position, and particularly the nation of Israel, that could bring to pass this great battle of Ezekiel 38. Russia continues in a position where it could become the impatient individual nation concerned about fulfilling its long stated desire toward world conquest. Remember something, a nation may talk about peace, but when it has 11,000 nuclear weapons pointed at you, that's what you must pay attention to. Colin Powell, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff of the United States has said, remember something, whatever you may think about Russia, it still possesses the only capability in the world to destroy the United States, and it could do it in 30 minutes. And so we will see, according to the scripture, an army move thunderously from the north in its attempt to conquer the Middle East and particularly to destroy the nation of Israel. What will happen then as a result from that battle? Well, there are some concomitant developments that we need to keep in mind that will produce a part of the wreckage and the new set of intentions that will come upon the world out of that. While these events have been going on with reference to the regathering of Israel, the positioning of the nations of the world, there will also be, according to the scripture, a reconstitution of a tremendous empire called the Northern Empire or the Fourth Kingdom, a revived Roman Empire. That has taken place as we have watched these events and that Roman Empire revived produces a very charismatic and communicative and convincing individual called the Antichrist, the man of sin. Now the Bible says that the Antichrist will make a covenant with the nation of Israel. Is that covenant perhaps in the offing today? Yes, it is. Israel looks out from that narrow sliver of land and says, who can we depend upon to be our friend for the days to come? Israel is not now satisfied with the attitude of the United States. The Israeli publications that we have the chance to see here in the United States point up the fact that a new anti-Semitism is, de is developing in the United States whereby Israel must look in other directions for a real friend. What will Israel do? Israel will look out from the ramparts of its tiny nation and decide that America cannot be dependent upon. All they get is maybe from America, and so what do they do? They look, of course, to the emergent empire, and that is the empire of Europe. And on the basis of the covenant that they make with the leader of Europe, Europe, in my opinion, has sent an army to the nation of Israel in response to that covenant to keep the oil lines open and all of this. When this tremendous invasion comes from the north, it, the, the leader of Europe will have a piece of the action in destroying that invading army from the north, and therefore before an onlooking and amazed world will take credit for having saved the world from this last smashing, irrational outburst coming from Russia. But the wreckage will be that Russia and its armies will be destroyed. In fact, the description of that is quite, quite pointed in the scripture. The Bible says, and they that dwell in the cities of Israel shall go forth and shall set on fire and burn the weapons, both the shields and the bucklers, the bows, the arrows, the hand spikes and the spears, and they shall burn them with fire seven years. It will take seven years to burn the weapons that are torn from the hands of that awful and beleaguered invading army. It also says, and seven months shall the house of Israel be burying them that they may cleanse the land. And here is especially where the expression Ham and Gog comes into play. They will bury them in a place called the Valley of Ham and Gog, the multitude of Gog, the multitude of people who were led by this aggressive military leader. They will be buried in all probability by the millions in this place called Ham and Gog. And the wreckage of that battle will not be that the world ends or the nations are destroyed, 
But the world will rather reconstitute itself with no longer the threat from r the Prince of Rosh, Meshach and Tubal, but this leader of Europe. Out of this amazing victory, that is from his point of view, will be escalated to world leadership. What will he produce? Peace and plenty and prosperity? No. He will produce a period of time called the tribulation, which ultimately matures into the great tribulation, at the end of which comes a spectacular event called the glorious return of Jesus Christ. So this set of events, the battle of Ezekiel 38 and 39, takes place on or near the beginning of that period of time called the tribulation. And it makes possible that set of events whereby the Antichrist is escalated to world power. Now, there are many events that grow out of this, such as what is the timing of the rapture of the church? We need to discuss that on subsequent broadcasts, but let me say to you that the Bible in the midst of all of these things says finally the world will be destroyed. But you and I can survive that destruction with the gift of God, which is everlasting life, which comes from knowing Christ as personal Savior. Don't believe in the promise of peace. Be prepared for the battle of Haman Gog and all of the remarkable events that shall come out of that.